Um, and the idea for me is that we need a history then of trying to understand how people have tried uh, to respond to planetary threats to see whether there may be lessons learned that would guide us going forward. And so in doing that, I can't think of anyone um, I'd rather hear from than, than Roger Pilkey when we're talking specifically about climate change. Uh, because I've learned a tremendous amount. Um, I still think of myself as, uh, as someone having a lot to learn, but, but what I do know, much of it I learned from, um, from reading Roger Pilkey, um, and also just from, from trying to apply some of the principles that uh, I think he's defended um, very effectively. Um, just basic principles of, of scientific integrity and being honest uh, about uncertainty. Um, he's somebody where the more you, uh, you read in his work, the more you realize that he's impossible to categorize um, even in this incredibly polarized field. He really doesn't you know, fit in um, in ways that make some people feel uncomfortable. Um, but I feel in ways that uh, make for incredibly valuable contributions in provoking us to think harder and think harder about, especially about our assumptions and our about, about our values. Um, so as an historian, I really appreciate uh, his values in, in this work. Um, I could tell you about some of the many things uh, that he's done. Um, I'll, I'll do that briefly because you have it already in, in your brochure. Um, many of you already know that he's on the faculty at the University of Colorado and he has been uh, for more than 10 years now. Before then he was a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, he's a recipient of multiple prizes and honorary degrees. Um, he's also the author of some excellent books um, that you should buy if you haven't already. And more recently, um, that would include The Honest Broker, Making Sense of Science and Policy and Politics, uh, and especially The Climate Fix, uh, What Scientists and Politicians Won't Tell You About Global Warming. It's a fantastic book. Um, I know that not just because I've, I've read it, but also because I know how hard it was to get a hold of it. Um, it's pretty much sold out in almost every uh, bookstore in Manhattan. Um, so I, I congratulate Roger on, on writing a book like that. Maybe someday I'll write a book like that too that will, will sell out as well. Um, so, so let me just turn things over to him and thank you again, Roger, for joining us. There you are. Well, thank you. We just had a, a nice discussion with the students in the program and I guess this, this will be a continuation of that discussion. I hope you'll jump in and interrupt. Um, I appreciate the nice introduction. What Matt didn't say is that if the publisher only prints like 175 copies, they sell out really quickly. <laughs> um, so the title of my talk is Climate Policy for a High Energy Planet, and I'll explain that. Um, and I have an, an ambitious goal with this talk. Um, I really don't want to convince you of anything other than there are some really powerful tools out there that you can use to get your arms around what is a very messy, difficult issue. Um, I will tell you what I how I apply those tools. Um, but as I'll tell you, um, you will have to do the hard work to, to understand this issue. Um, and th hopefully this talk will open some doors to understanding it. So the current context, we could talk a long time about how we got to where we are. Um, you're probably all familiar with uh, the fact that uh, President Obama uh, presented, finally, a, a climate policy agenda at a speech a couple of weeks ago at Georgetown. Uh, and then in the days afterwards, uh, Secretary of Energy Ernie Monitz um, emphasized how important coal was going to be in the future U.S. energy mix, uh, kind of a mixed message there. Um, there's a lot of attention being focused on the economy such that uh, climate change has dropped pretty far down, if it ever was very high. Um, Japan and Germany, uh, two countries that had very strong pledges, uh, Germany still does, Japan has abandoned theirs to reduce emissions. Uh, have seen their uh, emissions increase sharply. In Japan's case, they're burning a lot of oil uh, post Fukushima. Germany has said they're gonna phase out nuclear. They're on their way to doing that and they're uh, building coal at the fastest rate uh, in 20 years in that country. Uh, just last week, Angela Merkel told Europe that, they were, that she was not going to sign on to new uh, controls on uh, automobile emissions uh, because of Mercedes, Benz, and BMW. Um, international negotiations are at a standstill. Uh, there's an expectation that there will be a decision made in 2015 about future negotiations. Uh, China and India, meanwhile, keep growing um, and emitting. So how do we understand this context? And what I'm going to argue is that there's a, a, a common uh, pattern underlying pretty much the entire global geopolitics of the climate change issue. 
Um, to let you know where I stand, um, if you Google my name, you might find my father as a prominent scientist, but if you find me, um, you'll find people calling me names and you know, skeptic, denier, Marxist, leftist, climate hoax believer. Um, so I thought it might be useful as I start out just to tell you where I stand on issues. Um, um, I've been studying the climate issue uh, for 20 years, hard to believe, and I'm a strong advocate for both mitigation, that's related to energy policy, CO2, and adaptation, which is doing better with respect to climate variability and change. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that the continuing increase in the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, in particular, could pose large risks. And I would point you to the working group one of the IPCC if you want to get a good handle on the science. Um, stabilizing concentrations, that's a term of art, a technical term, which I'll explain precisely momentarily, um, at low levels can't succeed if we underestimate the scale of the challenge. One of the first things that you learn when you go to school to learn about policy is that if you misdefine the problem, you're unlikely to come up with effective interventions. Um, action on mitigation will not result from the elimination of all scientific uncertainty. Uh, I find that the debate, the continuing debate over the science of climate change is a distraction, it's harmful to the science, and it's something that we really are, must move beyond if we're going to make progress on this issue. Um, the politics of the issue are indeed poisonous. Um, it has become a very partisan issue. It is almost to the level of being a partisan litmus test in the United States. Um, the focus on extreme weather is a distraction and often ventures into the deeply scientifically unsound. And where I'm going to wind up today is uh, to argue to you that technological innovation makes political action easier, not the other way around. Hopefully that'll make sense by the end. All right, so why should you believe what I say? And the answer is, I mean, would you buy a used car from that guy? Um, you shouldn't believe what I say. I would ask that you do the math yourself. I'm going to present in this presentation a lot of graphs, a lot of data. All of it is replicable by you in an afternoon. Take a little time. Um, my students do it in the, in the graduate seminars I teach, um, and I don't think they really understand the issues until they do it themselves. So, so please carry with yourself a healthy dose of skepticism about the claims I'll make today, and then if you're interested, try it out yourself and see what answer you get. All right, let's start with the mainstream approach to climate change. Um, the mainstream approach is uh, what's been called the targets and timetables approach. Uh, there's some pretty graphs up there. And the way that it works is uh, scientists have come up in this, this generic phrase, scientists have said, um, that there's a two degree above pre-industrial threshold over which uh, climate change becomes dangerous, human-caused climate change becomes dangerous. The two degree threshold is associated with 450 parts per million concentration of carbon dioxide. Um, you can see on this graph, this is the 450 line, and then there's this dash line to throw a bone to the 350 people. Um, there may even be some 280 people out there who are pre-industrial. But the point there is, is that we can identify a threshold. You can then run climate models to give you a wide range of possible futures and come up with a probability of exceeding that threshold for different levels of emissions. So Bill McKibben, who you're going to hear from later this summer in this program, uh, has a, a widely read article in Rolling Stone called Do the Math. Perhaps you'll read it. But, um, I recommend it to you because it outlines this approach. Uh, you work backwards from that two degree threshold and that tells you what your allowable emissions are in order to have a 50% or more probability of staying below two degree. That total amount of emissions that you're allowed then tells us what we globally uh, can emit until, in this case, 2050 on this graph. You can then allocate those emissions according to population, GDP, historical responsibility, pick your uh, pick your criteria, and come up with some very colorful curves that say something about how emissions have to go down. Then you can take those curves and turn them into targets and timetables for emissions reductions. Um, so you may have heard 80% by 2050. Uh, Europe likes uh, a literal uh, numbers, 20% by 2020, 30% by 3030. 
that sort of thing. But you can come up with those strategies. That's where that comes from. And the idea is that the science dictates how we have to act and the pace at which we have to act. Now, I would call this um, the equivalent of scientific performance art. It's very authoritative looking. It's a good story, it sounds good. But really no one, no one, I mean me, you, we don't know what's behind these numbers. We don't know exactly what they mean. Someone smart put it together, but we really don't know what's underneath the hood. What I'm gonna offer to you is an alternative framing or construction of the issue it's, it's perfectly consistent with this view, but it's, I would say, more empowering from the standpoint of thinking about policy action. Um, the reality is that governments around the world do not look at colorful curves with the amount of emissions you're allowed and use that as the basis for constraining their economic growth, supporting technology. It just doesn't, the world just doesn't work that way. And let me say from the outside, uh, outset that the energy issue is far more than just climate change. Climate change is more than CO2. Uh, I'm gonna emphasize CO2. Uh, it's quite possible that we could, uh, it's difficult to believe as this is, we could deal with the CO2 issue and then still have a major human influence on the climate system set of issues remaining to deal with. Um, but energy is obviously more than just climate change. And from the outset, I wanna make it explicit that there are something like 1.5 billion people worldwide who have no access to electricity, none. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what that term means, access to electricity. Um, something like 800 million people uh, cook their food with, um, with dung, with wood, with trash. Um, energy is, is the foundation of wealth, prosperity around the world. So it's gonna be very difficult as the students I met with, we just talked about, it's very difficult to separate those out even though we've tried to in the climate issue. All right, so let's start with uh, the, the, the simple mathematics of stabilizing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So if you know how an, a bathtub works, then you understand the challenge of stabilizing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, stabilizing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the same thing as stopping the increase of water in a bathtub when you have the spigot turned on. The water coming in is equivalent to the emissions of greenhouse gases of carbon dioxide we're putting in the atmosphere, um, primarily from the burning of coal, natural gas, and petroleum. Um, there's some good news, it may be bad news um, also, is that there's a little hole in the bottom of the bathtub um, that's letting some of the water out. That's equivalent to the land surface uh, which takes up some of the carbon dioxide that we emit. Uh, plants get greener, they grow faster. The soil takes up some carbon dioxide. But a lot of the carbon dioxide is absorbed by the oceans. Um, you may say, oh, that sounds good, but it's bad news for the oceans because it, it changes the chemistry of the oceans, which may have negative consequences. Um, the only way the water in the bathtub stops increasing is if the amount coming in equals the amount going out that little hole in the bottom. If you don't want to use the oceans as a sponge to take up excess carbon dioxide, then the amount going in, our emissions have to essentially go down to zero. That's how you stop the water increasing in the tub. Um, and how, however long it takes us to turn that spigot off, it dictates how high that water will be. Now sometimes um, scientists and advocates find themselves in arguments over how high is our bathtub? Is it at 450 parts per million? Um, there's even a group, 350.org, who's named themselves after a height of the bathtub. Um, I will tell you, I think that that debate is absolutely irrelevant. The reason for that is that the policies we would adopt to stabilize at 450, at 350, at 500, at 750 are identical. If we can figure out how to stabilize at 450 or 550, we can probably figure out how to stabilize it th at 350. Um, and so that's somewhat of a distraction in the larger debate. Now, let's look at the water coming in the spigot. This is a graph that comes um, from the Global Carbon Project. The black dots, I'm not sure if this, the black dots are, are actual emissions. And the colorful curves and the gray shaded area shows the projections that were made in 2000. And one thing to notice is that the black dots, the actual emissions are at the upper end 
of those projections. That were just made a decade ago. Here's an update to that. And one of the most interesting things about this graph is that if you start in 1990, where this graph begins and go to 2000, you see kind of a linear increase in carbon dioxide emissions, 1% a year. Then you see kind of whoosh, things shot up. Um, the growth rate uh, has been about 3%, 3.1%. It tripled. So during the time with which apparently we've expressed the most concern about accumulating carbon dioxide, our emission rate has tripled. So the water's coming in the bathtub faster. So that's bad news. Another way to look at this, and I'll return to this at the end, um, is the proportion of global energy that we consume that comes from carbon-free sources. If you want to shut off that bigot, the water coming into the bathtub, then for however much energy we consume, 90% or more necessarily is going to have to come from carbon-free sources. What this graph shows is the proportion of the global energy mix that comes from carbon-free sources from 1965 to 2012, the last year. And it's pretty fascinating because it starts out at about 6%. Then there's this rapid increase. It doubles in, in just about two decades um, to more than 13%, largely because nuclear power expanded by a factor of 100. That's carbon-free with a big punch. And, and uh, hydropower dams increased by a factor of 25 over that same time period. So much to my surprise, um, 1999 was the peak year for carbon-free energy worldwide. Uh, something like 13.3%. And now we're down to about 13%. So over the last almost 20 years, the world has not seen a growth in the proportion of energy that we get from carbon-free sources. So you may have read news stories and promotional things about the rapid growth of solar and wind, and it's true. There has been rapid growth, uh, but they still make up less than 1% of the total global energy supply. I'll return to this at the end. Um, what this graph shows, if you can see it, there's some green at the bottom. This is the annual increment in new energy coming online each year from 1966 through 2012. And the green part shows the, the portion that is carbon free. And what you see is that fossil fuels are, are not, not only winning, they are routing. They are, they are dominating uh, the growth still. All right, so let's say you are interested in stabilizing carbon dioxide. How might we think about that challenge? The good news from an analytical standpoint is that we can think about uh, the tools we have in the policy toolbox to deal with carbon dioxide comprehensively. And, and I say this and I, I sometimes I joke about it, but there is one sentence you can use that encapsulates the entire set of tools in the toolbox. People engage in economic activity that uses energy from carbon emitting generation. So dazzle your friends, win bets, impress your family. So we take that sentence, we turn it into variables, population, GDP, economic activity per capita, energy intensity of the economy, I'll explain that in a second, and carbon intensity of energy. So it's population, GDP per capita, total energy consumed divided by GDP, uh, carbon or carbon dioxide emissions divided by total energy that we consume. This is called the Kaya identity. It's named after the Japanese scientist who first proposed it. It was first proposed as a tool to help climate modelers. If you want to drive a climate model, you want to run it, one of the things you have to know about the future is what emissions will be. And if you want to know what emissions are going to be, you have to know something about how many people are going to be on the planet, the size of the economy, how they use energy, and how they produce energy. And it's good news, the units cancel when you get carbon equals carbon. That's the Kaya identity, you can Google it. You can read about it, it's the basis for a lot of literature. It turns out the Kaya identity is also an extremely powerful tool of policy analysis. Um, and that's the use that I'm going to put it to. So the Kaya identity tells us all of the tools in the toolbox if you want to reduce emissions to the level of stabilizing it. 
So with respect to each one of these four factors, there's a lever. So each one of these things can be used to reduce emissions. So less people, all else equal, equals less emissions. A smaller economy, all else equal, equals less emissions. Increasing efficiency, so that means doing the same or more with less energy, uh, that reduces emissions. Increasing efficiency is a different thing than not doing anything at all. So if you're lying in bed one day and you say, you know, I don't want to go to work today, I'm going to reduce my carbon footprint, no, that doesn't work. Being, being lazy doesn't work. You have to do the same or more with less energy. Um, and then the final category there is uh, reducing carbon intensity of our energy sources, uh, so generating energy with less emissions. So if you switch from coal to natural gas, you become more carbon efficient, about 40 to 50 percent more carbon efficient. If you switch from coal to nuclear or wind or solar, you get a much bigger punch. But these are all the tools that are in the toolbox. All of the policy instruments that you may be discussing or have heard of, cap and trade, a carbon tax, contraction and convergence, uh, all of them are focused on modulating these levers. And the good news from an analytical standpoint is that there's nothing else. There's no other levers that you can use out there. This is comprehensive. Um, you may wish there was some rabbit you could pull out of a hat because the good news is also the bad news. This is all you have. So I'm going to make things a little simpler for our discussion. I'm going to combine population and per capita wealth and just call that GDP. So that's economic activity. And I'm going to combine the technologies of energy consumption with the technologies of energy production. So the technologies of consumption are PowerPoint projectors and lights and cars and airplanes. And the technologies of energy production are power plants and solar panels uh, and so on. That's technology. And so we have two factors. Emissions result from GDP times technology. Now let me at this point introduce um, what I call in my book um, the iron law of climate policy. It's one of those things you put in a book and then after the book comes out and people start talking about it, you realize, well, that maybe that, was, that, that actually grabbed people because that's probably the one concept from the climate fix that people talk the most about. And I'm going to illustrate it this way. This is a graph, it's, it's an opinion poll that was taken in the summer of 2009. It was taken right after the House of Representatives uh, voted on the cap and trade. And if you remember, the House passed the legislation, didn't get through the Senate. And at the time, uh, the, the, the pollsters asked people, the American public, would you support a generic climate bill if the annual cost per household was X? So the first number was $80 a year. And it turns out that at $80 per year, more than 50% of Americans, even with the partisan split on the issue, supported the idea of a climate bill. When it got to 10 times that amount, this is at 770, the number of people expressing support got up to less than 10%. So this downward sloping curve between inexpensive policy having high support and expensive policy having low support, I would argue it holds everywhere. Um, maybe the numbers are a little bit different. Maybe the proportions are different. And I would say it holds in this room too. So we'll just do a little experiment. How many of you would be willing and able to pay a dollar a year to support climate policy? Raise your hand, Si. All right. How many of you would be willing and able to spend a million dollars a year on climate policy? I'm hoping somebody raised their hand and I'll say, come talk to me about supporting our research. Um, so that's, that's a little facetious, but you, you pick your own numbers. The reality is that this downward sloping curve is just an essential fact of policy. If there's one area where there's a global consensus across political views, across religious views, demographic, um, it's this idea that the economic growth is important. Everyone loves economic growth. Um, so this led me to conclude um, that people around the world are willing to pay some price for climate policies. But this willingness has its limits. It has its limits in New York, in Europe, even in Boulder, where I'm from. 
Um, these limits mean that reducing GDP or noticeably reducing GDP growth are just not option, an option as a strategy of emissions reduction. Um, it's just not going to happen. So I, I call this a boundary condition for policy design. Climate policies must not cost too much, but even better, they should support economic growth because that's the direction of the prevailing winds. So at the same time people are talking about climate, there's been this wonderful success story. Or is it a success story? I put a question mark there. That the world is on track to meet the millennium development goal of having the amount of people who are in poverty, which is defined according to an arbitrary threshold of a dollar or dollar twenty-five a day. But what you can see is this sharp decline. And the Brookings Institution writes, um, the new estimates of global poverty presented in this brief serve as a reminder just how powerful high growth can be in freeing people from poverty. Now, I want you to think about the idea of freeing people from poverty in the context of the Kaya identity. That's illustrated with this graph, which I think is just fascinating. Um, what it shows, this is from the UN, is one of the background papers that was prepared um, as part of the Millennium Development Goal process. But it shows an estimate of global, global income distribution for three, three points in time. So the dark curve, the one on the left, that's 1970. The dashed curve, that's 2000. And then this light gray or blue, I don't know if you can see it on the right. My laser pointer's going away. Uh, that's 2015. And there's some normalized dollars, $100 on the left, 100000 on the right, where the bell curve gets uh, to the edges. Um, but what you see is this progression from your left to your right. That's reflecting the fact the world is getting wealthier. The income distribution is moving from the left to the right. So I would ask you, what direction do you think policymakers and the public want to see this curve move going forward? I'd argue they want to see it continue moving to the right. Now, if you think it's possible that there could be organized policy to move to the left, then you're going to take issue with the iron law of climate policy. But if you think that people are going to try to become wealthier um, and improve their material standing, then you basically accept the iron law of climate policy. Some, some notes, just some, some pointers. 80% of the world lives on less than $10 per day. So that's less than $4,000 a year. That's 90% that's of what's called the developing world. The question is, what do you think their material aspirations are? So 80% so of the world, that's like five and a half billion people. You think they want to live on more than $4,000 a year or less? Um, another note, typical salary of an academic, they're not Bill Gates, but they're doing fine in this global income distribution. Um, when I present this and I go to college towns, um, there's always academics who want to say, we have too much growth. They get into their Volvo and they drive back to their nice house. Um, it's very easy to say we have too much growth when you're at the right-hand side of the income curve. So I, I am going to leave behind at this point GDP as a, as a lever for reducing emissions. There's wonderful discussions we could have about income inequality, distribution of wealth around the world. I simply don't see it as a viable lever for stabilizing that water in the bathtub. So let's go back to the Kaya identity and see where that leaves us. All right, we have emissions equals GDP times technology, and I've just told you that you're not going to be able to use GDP in any meaningful way to reduce emissions. A corollary to this is that any discussion of emissions reductions without talking about GDP is incomplete because they're so closely tied together. So I'm going to use the magic of mathematics and put GDP over with emissions, isolate technology, and I'm going to argue that a reduction in this ratio of emissions to GDP is an indication, at least with respect to carbon, that we're making progress. So we want emissions to go down and we want GDP to go up. And if that happens, that ratio goes down, that's progress with respect to technology. And so I'm going to show some numbers with respect to this ratio. And I'm going to define this reduction in that ratio as decarbonization of the economy. 
So decarbonization of the economy is reflected in a decrease in the ratio of carbon dioxide emissions to GDP. And 2006, which is the numbers that I used in the climate fix, and I'd be happy to talk about more recent numbers, um, the world emitted 29 gigatons of carbon dioxide, and the global economy was about $47 trillion. That equates to 0.62 tons of carbon dioxide per thousand dollars of GDP. Now, it's not enough to say we want to see that ratio reduce. Because mathematically, try it yourself, but trust me for a second, it's possible for this ratio to go down and emissions to go up forever. This is why a stabilization target actually matters. It doesn't matter if it's 350 or 450 or 550. You'll see the consequences are, are pretty much the same. But if you want to achieve stabilization, you have to actually have some level of this ratio um, where it reaches. And I'll, and I'll show you what that is. So historically, this is from 1980 to 2006, um, the global economy was decarbonizing. That's good news. We're not talking about doing something different. We're talking about accelerating a process that was already in place. Now, if you have good eyes, you might be able to see, I can't see the laser pointer. At the end there, um, that gets a little wiggly, flattens out. In fact, the decarbonization curve has turned around since 2006. Um, but the world has been decarbonizing for much of the past 100 years. There's that 0.62 tons of CO2 per thousand dollars of GDP. So we can ask a policy question that's enabled by the Kaya identity. So what if we want this uh, emissions to reduce by 80% by 2050? I just picked that as a number. Um, it's often bandied about. It's, it's, it's used by 350.org. You see the um, small island nations have used that number. If you like 70%, that's fine. 50% by 2050, that's okay too. 95%. None of the conclusions I'll present to you are, are dependent upon the selection of that number. Um, so you know now from the Kaya identity that we have to specify a rate of GDP growth in order to talk about what this decarbonization curve will be in the future. So I'll give you five, um, and I'll give you an anchor. So this starts at that 0.62. And if we have to reduce emissions 80% by 2050 for five different rates of GDP growth, so 1% to 5%, um, and to give you an anchor, 1980 to 2006 was 3.5%, all of them are below 0.1. So we're at 0.62. So if I say we have to go from 0.62 to 0.1, you might say, oh, that's only 0 0.5. 0 0.5, that's a small number. Easy, no problem. So what I'd like to do next is give you a sense of what is that in terms of a, of a policy ask. What does that mean more intuitively than these abstract decarbonization numbers? And the reason I say that uh, the, the stabilization target doesn't matter and the emissions, the amount doesn't matter, they're, they're all below 0.1. And if you want to go below 0.2, that's fine. But the challenge of getting that low is essentially the same from a policy standpoint. It's insensitive to your target because the challenge is so large. So I took the middle range and I stapled it onto that historical curve. That's what it looks like. That's what we would have to do for a 3% uh, GDP growth rate. And I'm gonna start, I'm gonna drill down now and I'm gonna talk about the United Kingdom. Um, United Kingdom in 2008 passed the, the most rigorous legislation of any country in the world for the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions. So it provides a wonderful test of efforts to try to decarbonize through policy. Here's the decarbonization curve for the United Kingdom. So this is tons of carbon dioxide per thousand dollars of GDP. And like most uh, large industrialized economies, you see this steady downward slope from 1980 to 2006. Um, the UK is actually a very carbon efficient economy. They're about 50% more carbon efficient than the global average. They're at 0.42 tons of CO2 per thousand dollars of GDP. One reason for that is they have offshored a lot of their manufacturing, which was very energy and carbon intensive. Um, these graphs, which come from the Financial Times, uh, show manufacturing output is the top curve and manufacturing employment on the bottom, and all you need to see is the slope. The slope shows that manufacturing went from about 32% in 1970 uh, to about 12% in 2007. 
So the legislation that was passed by the UK Parliament in December 2008 uh, mandated that the UK reduce its overall emissions by 34% 1990 levels by 2022. So now that we have the Kaya identity as our tool, we can say, well, what does that mean for decarbonization? So here's that curve, starts with that 0.42. When I first did this analysis, I assumed that the economy of the UK was going to grow. Turns out that the economy of the UK has shrunk fairly dramatically since then, um, which gives the illusion of progress with respect to carbon when there's not any progress. I'll show you some updated data shortly. Um, David Cameron would be doing backflips of joy at 2% annual GDP growth. Uh, but here's five numbers from 1% to 3%. And in your mind, you can scale it up to 0% if you want. The point here is all of these numbers are about 0 0.15 to 0 0.2 um, by 2022. What does that mean? What does that mean intuitively? So I'm going to use France as a way to, to answer that question. France has the lowest ratio of carbon dioxide to GDP of any big economy. Who knows? Why is that? Shout it out. Nuclear power, they're at 0.3, they're less than half the global average. And I have a bunch of countries here, you can recognize them by their flags, Germany, Japan, United States, China, Britain, India, Australia, Canada, Italy, pick your favorite. No one is lower than France. But the point I want to make with this graph, here's the UK, 0.42. If they're going to get below 0.25, they have to go through 0.3 where France is, on their way to that lower value. So what does it mean in practical terms for the UK to be as carbon efficient as France? It's a question we can answer empirically. First, let's take a look at the French decarbonization curve. So this is 1984 to 2006, and it turns out that France actually went from 0.42 to 0.3 over a period of 20 years. It is possible. A large economy can decarbonize from 0.42 to 0.3. The question is, can the UK do it faster? Can you do it via policy? So what would it take? So here's those decarbonization curves implied by the UK Climate Change Act. I put this red dot, which is France, where they were in 2006. If we bring that across to where it crosses the axis and then drop it down, that tells us by when the UK would have to be as carbon efficient as France so as to be on, on path to hitting its uh, emissions reduction goals. And if you squint, I tried to make that red dot really big um, so that it hit 2015. It doesn't quite get to 2015. Um, and so I have fun with my UK colleagues and I have this title, Can the UK Become France by 2015? But that's what's implied, to be on, on pace to hit that decarbonization target. What does that mean in terms of energy? So what I've done is I've scaled the magnitude of the challenge of being as carbon efficient as France in terms of carbon-free energy. I'm going to use nuclear power plants. This is the Dungeness B nuclear power plant on the coast of Kent in England. It's a one gigawatt nuclear power plant. Um, sometimes when I show this picture, some people see nuclear and they, their mind goes blank and they don't see anything for the rest of the talk. This is just a measuring stick. If you like solar panels or offshore wind or whatever, you can use, it's like being measured in pounds or kilograms. Just because you're measured in kilograms doesn't mean you weigh less. Um, so I'm using a nuclear power plant just to give you a sense of the scale. So the question is, how many Dungeness B nuclear power plants worth of carbon-free energy would have to be deployed by 2015 for the UK to be on pace to hit that 22 target? Here's the answer. The answer is 40 nuclear power plants worth of carbon-free energy. Now, this tells you the magnitude of the test. The United Kingdom government has something called the Climate Change Committee which has put together a big, thick report that has taken this magnitude and spread it out all over the economy. 
You could put insulation in buildings. You could have electric cars. You could build onshore wind, offshore wind. Um, that doesn't make the task any easier or small. I'd say it, make it makes it harder. But raise your hand if you think that the deployment of 40 nuclear power plants worth of carbon-free energy in the UK in the next 18 months is going to happen. Probably not. So I gave this in a talk in 2008. Um, and it was a fairly public talk, big audience. Some people from the Climate Change Committee were in attendance. It was written up by the BBC. And at the time, Colin Challen, who was the chairman of the all-party parliamentary climate change group, said this. He said, Pelkey's analysis raises questions which I do not think have been factored into the thinking behind the Climate Change Act. The task of cutting emissions is already staggeringly huge and, as we have seen, well beyond our current political capacity to deliver. Then he said something which I think gives us a little window into why it is we're not making more progress. And I'll return to this momentarily. He says, he throws a prime example of ducking the responsibility. It's hard to see any tough choices being made in the current climate. So hold on to that Heathrow thought for a second. Now, when this was presented publicly, a uh, 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 leading economist, Terry Barker, for the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the big dog in the climate change issue, um, he was quoted in that same news story, and he said, Professor Pelkey's intervention was rejected by economist Terry Barker. Now, one of the good things about economics and emissions reductions policy is that time allows us to evaluate arguments. We don't have to do lean on academics arguing over esoteric things. 2011, The Guardian reported this. Britain will miss government carbon targets by increasingly wide margins over the next 20 years unless it introduces radical policy measures. Argues Cambridge Econometrics, a private company owned by a charity and chaired by the Cambridge University academic Terry Barker. So excellent. So we have agreement the UK is not going to hit its emissions reductions targets. So how's the UK doing since uh, it passes Climate Change Act? What this graph shows, it's a little bit complicated, but the two black bars at the bottom show rates of decarbonization. Uh, the bottom is 2000 to 2008, so that's right up until when the Climate Change Act was passed. The next black bar up shows the rate of decarbonization from 2009 to 2012. So over the four years since the Climate Change Act was passed, just over 1%. The red bars show what would be implied by 1%, 2%, and 3% GDP growth. More than 3, more than 4, more than 5%. So actually, the UK has moved backwards in the four years since the Climate Change Act was passed. So my analysis is out of date. It's not 40 by 2015. It's probably more. So let me return to the Heathrow debate. Um, Heathrow Airport, how many people have been there? It's, it, it's not the most efficient airport. It operates um, at like 102% of capacity. And the United Kingdom seems to want to remain at the center of international travel. They want London to be a major city. Um, and they need more capacity. So starting really about six years ago, and really continuing to today, there's been a debate about building a third runway at Heathrow. And what you can see there are some um, Greenpeace protesters on the back of a British Airways jet. The sign says, climate emergency, no third runway. So they're obviously trying to make friends with travelers um, inside the plane. You may see just today uh, and yesterday, someone was climbing the shard in London, a new big building, same kind of a stunt. Um, and I'm going to illustrate while as, as well-meaning I have some fun with it, but as well-meaning as these folks are and as sincere as they are, these sorts of strategies are probably not helpful. Um, to extend it to a U.S. context, um, putting a circle around the White House and holding hands to protest Keystone XL would be in the same sort of category. So here's the broader context. While they're debating a third runway at Heathrow, China is building 100 new airports each Heathrow-sized and larger by 2020. This graph shows on the left is China's emissions in 2007, 6,511 megatons or 6.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide. 
The middle bar shows where it was in 2012, and it shows the annual increment. So each one of these added bars, that's the 2008 level, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. Increased by 50% by 2012. Uh, for comparison, the US is at about 5,000 or so. So China exceeds the US. What I did in the bar on the right is to show um, the entire emissions for various countries in 2012. So since 2007, China has added the emissions of the United Kingdom, South Africa, Australia, Brazil, and Germany. Right now, China is adding a UK worth of emissions about every nine or 10 months. So really, the, the, the third runway at Heathrow is where we want to put our time on environmental campaigning. It may be cathartic, but it's probably not the sort of thing that's going to affect those levers of the Kaya identity. Now, what I'm presenting is not new. Um, this is from Ken Caldera, Marty Hoppert, and colleagues. It was in Science 10 years ago. And they wrote, to achieve stabilization at a two degree warming, we would need to install 900 plus or minus 500 megawatts of carbon emissions free power generating capacity each day over the next 50 years. This is roughly the equivalent of a large carbon emissions free power plant becoming functional somewhere in the world every day. So a nuclear power plant worth of carbon free energy coming online every day from now to 2050. And I'm going to make things worse in a second. Um, so that's something like 10,000 plus or minus nuclear power plants worth of carbon free energy. That's the scale of the challenge. Now let me return to where I started with this idea of the billions of people who lack energy access. One of the, the dirty secrets, I guess, of climate policy is that the success stories we tell ourselves, the 450 stabilization scenarios, the 350 stabilization scenarios, for the most part, keep the vast majority of these 1.5 billion people in the dark. The reason for that is if you account for them having energy access at any reasonable level, it blows up your carbon budgets. We just don't know how to do that. So our integrated assessment models, our models of energy access in the future, um, have what I would call very pitiful levels of energy access um, and if you say energy access, maybe that makes the issue go away. So let me illustrate. What this shows um, are a number of numbers. Let's start uh, with the red bar. That's the 2010 actual per capita electricity consumption globally. 3,000 kilowatt hours over a year of consumption. That's the global average, including all of those people with no energy access. The black bar immediately above that, that's for 2035, comes from the US Energy Information Agency, projects about 50% more consumption per capita globally, about 4,500. That's equivalent to the next bar up. That's about the average of Bulgaria today. Now let's compare that to some other countries. So the next bar up, that's Germany. They're about 7,000 kilowatt hours. Per Very efficient, highly efficient country, wonderful transportation system, wonderful use of energy. Um, and then a the high example, that's the United States, that's us, that's more than 13,000. Now the definition of energy access, what does it mean to have energy access? That's on the bottom. That's the IEA, International Energy Agency. I don't want to pick on them because it's a very common number. It's about 2% of what we enjoy in the United States. So when I talk to my students and I say energy access, most of them are playing with a cell phone or a computer. They go to their house, they have air conditioning, they turn like, oh yeah, I know what energy access is, I got it. No, that's not energy access. Energy access is four hours a day of a 40 watt light bulb. That's it. To me, that seems like a very low, almost a pitiful amount. It helps us square our carbon budgets looking to the future, but it probably doesn't address issues of equity and the actual real world demands of people for true energy access around the world. So let's take a look, well, just, just as a thought experiment. So on the bottom again, there's um, that EIA actual. So this is the total energy consumption 
500 quads. Don't worry about what a quad is. It's about 15 nuclear power plants worth. 500 quads of energy consumption in 2010 worldwide. And you see the next, the black bar, the next one up is about 50% more by 2035. Um, it's very common. ExxonMobil has it, IEA has it, World Bank has it. And then let's, let's turn those numbers from uh, the Bulgaria equivalent, Germany equivalent, US equivalent into what that would imply in terms of global demand for energy. And all of a sudden you have a doubling of today's energy, a tripling, or even four to five times more. So if you would like, hypothetically speaking, the entire world to live like Germans, so very efficient, very high standard of living, then, and you want to decarbonize the economy at the same time, you don't need one nuclear power plant worth of carbon-free energy every day till 2050. You need three. So think about that for a second. The magnitude of the challenge of providing energy access, true energy access around the world, is larger than the climate change challenge. Right? The climate change challenge is one nuclear power plant per day to 2050, and the energy access challenge is two to three times. So when I make the argument that energy access provides a more compelling reason globally for energy innovation, that's the numbers that are behind it. Sure, climate change motivates a lot of people in the rich world. Um, but if you have energy access at 2% of what Americans enjoy, do you think that's a motivating factor for the vast majority of people around the world? I would suggest maybe not. All right, so let's wrap up here so we can talk. So what I'm suggesting here, based on these numbers, is that we really need to change the narrative of the climate debate. Um, a lot of the debate in the wealthy parts of the world focus on statements like, we use too much energy. Fossil fuels are too cheap. We need to make them more expensive. And I would flip that around and say, actually, we need vastly more energy. Sure, we should become more efficient in its use. It'll go further. But we're not going to use less. And part of the problem is that fossil fuels are too expensive. We need cheaper, cleaner, more accessible energy, not more expensive energy. So how fast can decarbonization of the global economy actually occur? And I think the starting point for good policy analysis here is to openly admit nobody knows. We're in uncharted territory. I can tell you that right now, and for most of the past decade, the world is recarbonizing. What that means, if you go back to the Kaya identity, that the carbon intensity of energy is going up, and the energy intensity of GDP, surprisingly, is also going up. So historically, before the last decade, there's about a 1% to 2% rate of decarbonization in developed countries. Um, I had graduate students one year go through all the historical data for decarbonization, said find the country with the fastest rate of decarbonization for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years. For five years, the fastest rate of decarbonization we could find was 4.4% per year. It was Japan when they got rid of their aluminum industry. They offshored it. Big energy hog and a GDP sink at the same time. 4.4%. For the US to hit 17% that uh, President Obama is committed to, um, by 2020, while, so it's 70% from 2005. So while maintaining modest economic growth, 1%, 2%, requires rates of decarbonization greater than 5% per year. We're not gonna hit that target. That's a prediction that I'm, I'm going to make. Um, the economic slowdown, the, the brief burst of shale replacing coal has given us some illusion that we're actually reducing emissions, and we have in the United States, but it's temporary. It's a small ch change in the price of natural gas, and that's going to reverse really fast. So this is, this is the graph I showed you before. This is the proportion of global energy that comes from carbon-free sources. And what you see went from 6% in 1965 up to 13% in 1999, and pretty much has stayed there. The green arrow shows where we need to go. So forget about all this nonsense about targets and timetables for emissions reduction. It's, it's, it's a sideshow. It's, it's a, uh, it, well, it's the path to insanity, number one, but it's also um, unlikely to bear fruit from a policy standpoint. The, the question we ought to be asking is, 
how are we going to generate 90% plus of our energy from carbon-free sources at the same time we double, triple, quadruple global energy supply? I would say that puts a different spin on the magnitude of the challenge and the sort of things we ought to be doing. Rather than talking about limits and constraints on emissions reduction, we ought to be talking about the opportunity afforded by cleaner, more accessible energy. All right, so I'm going to finish up. Two more slides. So hopefully um, you've gotten the sense, and I'm happy to discuss it further, that the policy logic of targets and timetables is exactly backwards. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Um, climate policy should not, as an outcome, keep poor people poor, and it shouldn't keep them in the dark. Morally, I think that is a non-negotiable outcome. Cap and trade can't succeed. We have ample, success, success, uh, ample experience with that, both from a policy standpoint and trying to implement it and a political standpoint and trying to tighten it. Carbon tax similarly can't do the job. I would um, ask you, how do we deal with other sorts of wicked problems that we don't, we start out by saying we don't know the answer? And um, I'll just, just give you one, advancing human lifespans. How, how was it the world was able to advance the average human lifespan by several decades, 20, 30 years, um, over a century? Did we get together and have a global treaty that specified targets and timetables for lifespan improvement? And I, I make a joke, and you know, there's some economists who, who tell me it's identical to cap and trade, but why not put a price on death and have tradable death permits to create in incentives for innovation in medicine? It would work, according to economic theory. People laugh at it. Um, it's the same logic, yet we were able to make progress. So I'll go back to this graph. So imagine this is the human lifespan graph. Um, it had a curve something like that. How were we able to do that? All right, so I'll end. This is from Jesse Ausubel. Um, this is a picture of the world at night from space. Um, kind of a present picture. You, maybe you can make out North America and Europe there. It's probably all you can make out. They also say, well, what does the world look like if everybody lives like North Americans and Europeans? That's this world. So that's the world we're headed for, like it or not. We can go there in dirty, energy, uncoordinated, unthinking fashion, or we can do it smart. I'd argue for the smart. Um, here's how you can find me. I welcome your feedback, your criticism, your comments. A lot of papers related to this talk you can download. And I run a blog that's um, currently dormant for the summer while I'm doing fun things like visiting you guys. Um, but it should be spun back up by September. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. So Roger, there. Um, you know, the, the title of the book is What Scientists and Politicians, or the subtitle, What Scientists and Politicians Won't Tell You About Global Warming. Um, but there, there, for those of you who haven't read it, um, you know, there, there are other things uh, you know, in the book and um, it's things that you didn't have time to talk about today, um, and also in, in your blog as well. And um, as provocative as, as you've been uh, this evening, um, you're even, in some ways, even more provocative in some of the, the chapters that follow. Um, so, for instance, about um, how it is uh, in what uh, some scientists, anyway, and politicians especially, tell us about climate change, that they're oftentimes, um, you know, misrepresenting um, not just these kinds of facts, but, but others as well, about, uh, about climate science and about climate uh, modeling. Um, so I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, just give us a, a flavor, you know, for some of the, the very direct uh, arguments you make about, um, for instance, um, some of the work that you, you're especially well known for about uh, uh, hurricanes, for instance, and how that figures in, in climate politics. Yeah, let me, um, I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> that, I know that's, that's that a lot we could yeah. talk about here, but yeah. but if you go back to one of that first graphs that I showed with the integrated assessment model and you know the Keeling curve sort of approach, um, early on it it, be, it became part of the debate um, that there had to be consensus reached on views on the science of climate change as a precondition for political action to occur. Um, there was this idea that that skepticism which has morphed into denialism, um, was simply not acceptable. Uh, and we've embarked on a path, and I think it's abated somewhat, um, 
partly the skeptics have run out of steam and partly the scientists have grown frustrated and moved on to other things. Um, but there's really been a, 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 a ongoing debate involving advocates, high-level scientists, politicians, to try to scrub the world clean of skepticism. And um, there's a couple things to say about that. One is that, that it reflects a belief that um, there's some sort of causal link between the degree of belief in science and certain political or policy outcomes. Um, in the book, I provide some data that's taken from um, the political science literature, had nothing to do with climate in which um, the, the scholars asked, what was the level of public opinion when major action took place on various issues? Um, and it turns out, just broke this way for the 36 cases they looked at, that in 18 of the 36 cases, public opinion was in the direction that action took place. And in 18 other cases, it was in the opposite direction. Um, the fact that something like 70% plus or minus of the American public thinks climate change is real and has a human component um, has remained more or less steady over 20 to 25 years. Um, the fact that something like 65% of Americans will say they support action on climate change um, places the issue right into a sweet spot where um, there's nothing unique or special about public opinion on climate change um, that would lead you to think that we cannot take action on this issue. Um, what you do see is that all of the efforts to enforce or motivate a unified view of the issue have turned the issue into a political litmus test. If you are a good Republican, you better be against that climate issue. If you are a good Democrat, you better be helping to get rid of the, the world of climate deniers. Um, and it's actually, it's fair to say, you know, what comes first on that issue now, the politics or the science. Um, and continued efforts to try to win that political battle over the science have just led to more polarization. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a, you know, a great, ex it, the, the, it has very little effect on policy outcomes, I think as I've shown. Um, because there has been very little <laughs> policy effect. Um, what it does do, though, is it has served to, to politicize the scientific community. It has undercut the legitimacy that leading scientists have in political debates. If you take a look at um, polling data over the last 15 years, um, one trend that is consistent across Republicans, Democrats, and independents, in varying degrees, of course, is uh, the belief that the scientific community exaggerates claims on climate change. Um, and that's partly a, a reflection of the idea that this has just become a politicized issue. Um, you see this, I mean, you raise the issue of hurricanes. Um, the science of hurricanes, you know, looking back in time, there are projections we're gonna have more intense hurricanes going forward, but looking back in time, the science of hurricanes, it is not rocket science. Um, Counting hurricanes is pretty straightforward. You don't, you don't miss them. When Sandy comes through New York, you see that it's here. So counting up the number of hurricanes that have made landfall um, historically is pretty straightforward science. And the reality is there has not been an increase in those storms. Um, might there be in the future? Very possibly so. Um, in fact, right now we're in the longest stretch of no category three, four, and five hurricanes hitting the United States um, of uh, the last 100 plus years. So when President Obama stands up at Georgetown to talk about climate change, and it's just a throwaway line, I know, and he says, uh, you know, we're having more droughts, floods, um, storms, and then it, when he did his radio address, he actually said hurricanes, and not a single climate scientist, the bloggers, the public faces, say, well, he actually got this point wrong. Not one of them says that. It's a sign to me that there's something not quite right in the scientific community. Because you can imagine, if George W. Bush stood up in 2003 and said, the world is not warming, you can imagine that the scientific community would have gone nuts to correct that error. I think the scientific community gains legitimacy by being fair-minded about equally correcting uh, 
you know, misstatements by public officials, even if they support the cause. So I think that the disaster issue is one. Um, there's a long story that I relate in the book, and it's gotten longer since the book was written, about how the IPCC has had very difficult times with the disaster issue. They finally did get it right in 2012. Um, but the scientific community um, has become wrapped up in the politics, and I think that hurts the science. And I don't think it's particularly related, related to the policy issues associated with energy. Um, people who care about energy and discuss and debate energy actually, they don't much care about climate science or what the scientists say to begin with. I think it's a much more at home issue for the scientific community. So uh, let me um, open the floor. I see there are a few of us ready to engage. Uh, thank you for the talk. I'm wondering, uh, you talk a little bit about, um, in your book, about the kind of the role of scientists and how in many ways scientists kind of get in this tendency to exaggerate things or not do the things that you believe they should do. And I'm just wondering, in order to deal with this climate change issue, it seems like almost people often say that the science is already done. They're, the science is concluded. The science, we know what the science is. It's going to happen. So I'm wondering, what do you think the role of the scientists should be from here on forth, if in fact you assume that this science is already known conclusively that this climate change issue is really an issue worth uh, dealing with? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, it's, it's really important to say, I mean, and I, I do give the scientists a hard time, um, I think deservedly so, but, but the scientific community really over almost a half century has done a, a great job of bringing to the public's attention a challenge, a problem that the public would not otherwise be aware of. Um, and it's well established that humans affect the climate system and that effect could be very negative going forward. And we have the scientific community to thank for bringing that to our attention. What that does is it opens up a space of possibility. Where the scientific community got into trouble was in then trying to use the science to close down that space. It's cap and trade, it's carbon trading, no skeptics. Um, what we need help with now is in the creation of new policy options. This became really evident after c the Copenhagen Climate Conference in 2009. Um, world leaders were there. Uh, Der Spiegel, the German newspaper, has a fantastic, really eye-opening audio recording of the world leaders, Merkel, Sarkozy, Obama, sitting around a table actually talking to each other about this issue. Um, the long story short is that um, Copenhagen was a crash. It was a disaster. Um, and you would think when a policy fails, what we normally would do is say, what else you got? That one didn't work. Let's try something else. And because um, the climate issue had become so narrow so quickly, um, the answer was, I got nothing. Let's wait until 2015 and then try it again. Um, and what I would love to see is much more attention on, this is kind of inside baseball, but working group three issues. So economics issues, and even broadening it beyond climate change. So you can read my talk as an effort to try to expand the issue. Let's put energy access at the center. Try that for a while. See if that gives us more motivation for energy innovation. Um, will it work? I have no idea. Is it better than cap and trade? Yeah, I'm very convinced about that. Um, but I would love to see the scientific community in wholesale support of more perspectives, broader discussion. Um, I'll just cite another example. There's a German scientist who um, provided his taxonomy of deniers. And at one level, there are the climate science deniers. You don't believe there's a problem. The second level is the climate impact deniers. These are the people who don't believe that the impacts are severe. And at the third level are the climate policy deniers. They're against the framework convention on climate change. Now, once you equate belief in science with belief in a single policy, I think something's gone very wrong in how we deal with sticky issues with, without a lot of possibility. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. So. Um, I, I like the fact that you brought up um, energy access to the forefront. It's very important. It's one of the uh, millennial goals. So my question is more the human aspect. Um, if energy access was afforded to everyone on the planet, if it was renewable, if it was carbon-free, it could be done in a day. 
Would there be anyone to stop it? Would it be adopted freely by a people? So here's the, the, the big challenge, is that um, it would be nice if we had the technologies at scale that were carbon free, mm -hmm. that were technologically ready, economically affordable, and politically acceptable. Um, we have a technology that um, provides lots of energy, is reasonably safe, that is sharply contested, nuclear power. Right? The world could, could set on a path of saying we're going to replace every coal plant worldwide with the nuclear power plants. Would it cost money? Yeah, it would cost money. Um, a lot of climate advocates would probably say it's cheaper though given the costs and benefits, the externalities and so on. So what do you do with uh, nuclear proliferation issues? What do you do with the Middle East? What do you do with nuclear waste? Um, what do you do with technology transfer? Um, we could build large dams. Africa has a lot of places where you could still build very large dams for hydropower. Um, you could build uh, solar farms that take a big footprint. Um, one of the most contested issues in Australia and in Great Britain right now is the siting of, of wind farms. People don't want them. So the energy issues, they very rapidly involve much more than just climate considerations. And at every energy technology, there's a constituency for and against. So my reading of that is that the politics are such that there isn't a global consensus on either energy access or climate change. Um, Germany is right now um, deciding they would rather have CO2 emissions than nuclear power. Is that acceptable in a democracy? I don't know. So it becomes really difficult really fast. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, my, uh, my question kind of follows up on that in that, um, you know, you alluded earlier in our like discussion to like the hungry world and stuff like that and how, you know, these other kinds of, you know, non-grandiose things can motivate important action. But like, if the energy access problem is happening in the poorest parts of the world, like what's the strategic concern that's going to make rich countries do something about it? Particularly when, I mean, you know, I mean, the other part of that book says that part of the solution is the strategic thing, but also the way you frame the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, like, was global hunger actually solved? No, not really. Right, right. Um, and I mean, you know, it's like we've made a lot of advances with, you know, health and things like that, but like malaria is unsolved because it's not of interest to pharmaceutical companies. So, well, I mean, what do you see being that thing for energy access in the dark parts of the world, not yeah. China and India? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And um, I have some numbers. I just wrote them down from memory. I don't know if they're correct. I tweeted them around from a, I was at a meeting earlier this week on energy access. Um, so take Pakistan. Pakistan has, and I think these are right, you can check me, but they're approximately correct, um, 7,000 megawatts of installed electricity capacity for 90 million people. 7,000 for 90 million. Virginia, the state of Virginia, has 40,000 megawatts for 7 million people. So I would say, do you think energy access has anything to do with the geopolitical situation that Pakistan finds itself in um, and relations between Pakistan and the United States and so on. Um, I would say that there are a lot of related issues. They may not be linear and they may not be directly causal issues um, for which energy access plays a key role. Um, the previous questioner mentioned the Millennium Development Goals. It turns out that energy access was not a Millennium Development Goal. I wasn't involved in the process, I don't know why. Um, I think it will be going forward. I think the next decade is the UN is targeted to be the international decade of, of, of sustainable energy for all. Um, but it has not been at the center of discussions like climate change has been, like other issues have been. Um, and I would say, you know, for the students here, think about it, Why, how much time do you spend debating worrying about discussing policy options for energy access versus climate change. Why is it? What is it about the issue that has led to one versus the other? Um, and I think that energy access, as I you know, provided the numbers, provides a really compelling justification for innovation policy. Um, 
for spending money on innovation policy, but one that the, the majority of the world can get behind in a way that they are very wary about climate policy. Thank you very much for uh, joining us here. Um, I just have a quick question in terms of the emphasis on uh, energy access. So, you know, your time out, putting a lot of investments into renewable energy research, more so than focusing on mitigation or mitigation by changing people's behaviors. Yet the statistics that you put up there seemed a little bit unrealistic in terms of what we have to achieve and the progress that we have currently. And especially seeing like some of the biggest leaps like Japan and the UK, for instance, in um, energy intensity efficiency was due to outsourcing. So pretty much you're like pushing these energy intensive industries to other countries that have worse infrastructure, that are more inefficient, that have less access to renewable energy. And given this process, it seems that this, that focusing on that is not going to reach the levels that we need, especially given that solar and wind are kind of really cost inefficient right now without severe subsidies. Uh, nuclear power is highly contested and hydroelectric power is very limited in terms of where it can be placed. So my question would be, how, how are you supposed to, in just in emphasizing this, how are you supposed to meet the goals that have been set forward for reaching carbon neutrality? Like how, what are some policies that we can look to more specifically? Yeah, all right, so I'll give you, uh, let me just give you two answers. One of them is um, to repeat, to do the math yourself when you have a chance. Um, the, 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 the uncomfortable reality is if you want to stabilize carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, from today's level, 90% or more of our energy consumption has to come from carbon-free sources. It could be coal with CCS, it could be nuclear, it could be solar, it could be wind. Pick your... It, mathematically, it has to be that way. Now, you might say, well, I want efficiency to play a big role, and I want to reduce the amount of energy we consume. Okay, let's say you reduce today's energy consumption, that 500 quads, to 250. 50% reduction. Nobody thinks it's possible. Let's just say that we posit it. What have you done? Now only 80% of your energy has to come from carbon-free sources. So you don't really change the, the nature of the task. We have to get the vast majority of our energy consumption from carbon-free sources. Um, this is something that I think we need to have very crystal clear, is that all of the instruments that we talk about, cap and trade, carbon tax, the purpose of all of these instruments is to motivate innovation and energy systems so that we get to that 90%. And so the debate is really about the means to achieving this larger goal. What I'm trying to do is put that larger goal right in front of you, because if, if we can't do that, then we will have failed. Um, when you talk about what policies do we do, I would go back to human lifespans, um, agricultural production, and people are too wrapped up in how we finish the job. How do we get to 90%? I have no clue. And I, you know, really, I don't care. What I care about is how we get from 13%, where we're at now, to 15%. And from 15% to 20%. Until we make those first little steps, then it, it, it's, it's irrelevant to talk about that. And the world's going to look different when we're going from 50% to 55%. So this is the, the, the comprehensiveness and hubris associated with solving the climate crisis in one big bite is one of the factors that has kept us at 13% for 20 years. Um, how are we going to feed the world of 10 billion people who want to eat like Americans in 2050? I have no idea, and most um, agricultural experts don't either, but they know how we improve agricultural productivity and we go from a world of 7.5 billion to a world of 7.8 billion. And so I think part of effective um, policy design is a recognition of where we're just fundamentally ignorant and just in being okay with saying we don't know how we're going to finish the job. Um, so that's, that's what I would say about policy. Let's, 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 Forget about the 2050. What are we going to do to 2020? And until we can move that dial on that 13%, then we're, we're just spinning our wheels. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm curious as to where the United States is in your analysis. 
because I saw some you know, interesting analysis of the UK and a lot of talk about China. But China is actually the fastest decarbonizing country in the world right now, and we're definitely not. And on a per capita basis, we're still emitting way more than China is. And in terms of, of the energy access argument, I think it really comes in here because, so Agarwal and Narain back in 1991 made the argument about luxury emissions versus survival emissions. The energy access argument is about survival emissions. It's about you know the basic necessities of life and how many people in the world are denied that. And the counterbalance of that is how many people in the world have way, way past the necessities of life and the incredible wastefulness of the way that this society is constructed. And it seems to me that there's a very strong argument to be made about the United States that was not in your presentation, and I'm wondering why. Um, it's in the book. Um, I also have Australia and Japan, and I start with the UK just because they were out of the gates first. Um, I can do a similar analysis with the United States. I have the number in terms of required nuclear power plants. Um, the US, just in case you're curious, is about 13.5% of our um, energy consumption comes from carbon-free sources, so a little bit above the global average. Um, it's incorrect to say that China is decarbonizing faster than the US. Actually, China is the primary reason why the world has recarbonized. Um, in terms of intensity, not in terms yeah, of... Yeah, intensity. So, so according to the 2012 figures, they decarbonized at 3.5% in terms of per dollar of GDP. Yeah, we can, we can discuss the data. I'd be happy to share that. I just put it up. Um, had a piece up about this yesterday. China is actually, their energy intensity is turned around, um, and so has their carbon intensity. So, um, look, the, the emissions in the UK, in Germany, um, what else, did, in the, the five countries that I had up there, are about equivalent to the United States. Um, the, the source of growth worldwide in emissions is going to be from countries that today are relatively poor. Um, we could take the United States off the map, pretend it doesn't exist, and it really doesn't change the mathematics of the carbon challenge. Um, I will take issue with this distinction between survival emissions and luxury emissions. Um, you know, in kind of a, a smart aleck way, I, I, I explained that climate campaigners would like to make um, better, higher quality, poor people, but still poor people. They kick around their soccer ball that allows them to plug in the light at night. They have their four hours of light bulb, but they don't have dishwashers. They don't have washing machines. They don't have iPads. Um, I mean, we, you start with the light bulb, and then you get to the dishwasher and the washing machine. So, I mean, the reason that, right. that, that energy access is not a millennium development goal is because they were set in 2000, and c clean water was considered a far more important goal than energy access. They're, you know, it's one of many problems. Yeah, you know, I don't know why energy access, there's a lot of discussion and, and debate about why it wasn't on there. It's not that it wasn't proposed. Um, but the, the simple reality right now is that 20% of the world's population uses 80% of the energy. And you could say, well, let's cut them back by half, by two-thirds. You still have the other 80%. And just do, I, I'd ask you to do the math. How, how high are their energy con demands going to go? Are they going to go to 1,000 kilowatt hours per year, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, to Bulgaria levels? Um, the reality is the world is going to consume massive amounts of new energy irrespective of whether Americans or Europeans or Australians or Japanese have luxury emissions. Um, I think the idea that, um, that you're going to address the emissions problem by asking some people to cut back um, fundamentally misses the nature of the problem. I'm all for more equity globally and I'm all for talking about whether we consume too much but I'm also for being clear that that discussion is not the same discussion as how do we stabilize carbon dioxide. Um, and I'd be happy to see you work out the math of emissions that show me differently. I think we have time for one more question. Daniel. Uh, thanks. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, like uh, in your presentation, you give a lot. There are, there's a lot 
you, you pick a lot of bones kind of with climate scientists and the kind of climate policy elite so far, and I take a lot of your points, and I think they're, they're pretty persuasive, but it seems like you've kind of left one group out in terms of why things aren't happening, and that's basically very wealthy capitalist executives uh, and other rich people in the U.S. So we know that you know, less than 1% of Americans give the fewer than 1% of Americans give donations of more than $200 in elections. Um, you know, when you look at like the US cap debate, you have a substantial number of met people and you know, executives in places like the Chamber of Commerce who are closing ranks with the oil industry, even though you could easily make an argument that they would stand to benefit from different policies, but clearly on the issue of government regulation, they're opposed. Uh, and you point out correctly that there's more than enough public opinion support for climate policy, but we also know that the, um, if you look at the relationship between public opinion and policies that are passed, uh, Larry Bartels at Princeton did this work, you know that overwhelmingly it's the, the opinion of the top third of income and even higher, which relates to policy, and there's like a 0% correlation between the bottom third uh, and policies that are passed. So when you're saying, so I, you know, I, I think you're right that energy access is a compelling issue, but it, you, you can't on the one hand say that energy access is a more compelling issue than climate change, and at the same time hold, I think correctly, that climate change is already kind of compelling enough. I mean, the question is, what is it going to take to remove the opposition to you know, regulatory policies and to taxing policies that has been, you know, largely held, been held up by very wealthy people, um, people who are paying for things like the Tea Party? So, you know, like where, where, is this, like where is this group and where is this political force in your story and why, why have you left it out of the kind of morality tale that you have? Yeah, all right, so there's a few things here. Um, one is that um, when cap and trade failed in the US, um, President Obama had a filibuster proof majority in the Senate. He had an overwhelming majority in the House. And he was a Democratic president. And it was blocked by 10 mostly Midwestern senators who have interest in coal. So if the criteria for action is we need to get even more left-leaning Democrats into office, um, I think it's just a, a recipe for failure. It sounds great, it's partisan, it rallies certain troops, but a trans, an energy transition is going to require support for a generation. Um, there has never been a time when the presidency, the Senate, and the House was controlled by a single wing of a single party for anything approaching that amount of time. Right, but the, so, but the argument that I'm making is that people, or that people like Theodore Scotchpole have made is that you, you have basically moderate Republicans who can't make the kind of votes that I, I'm sure you would suggest that they would make because of pressure from funders and from grassroots groups that are financed by You know, there's, there's, like there's the two ways to look at that. And there's one thing that you can, one way to look at that is to that say there's something inherently wrong with this political party, this group, with their view. And we have to either change their, their views or get them out of office. There's another way to look at it and to say, I need to design a policy architecture that appeals broadly to people of differing political perspectives. Um, there are aspects of what I have written in my book which some Republicans find appealing. Interestingly, go online, that is used to impute, impeach my views. I would think, you know, where's the award from the environmental groups saying you finally have gotten Republicans to talk about climate change? So I think we have to figure out what's, what's the cart and what's the horse here. Um, I would say, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm of the view, and I will apologize for this, I'm not of the view that um, rich industrialists and oil companies that are in association with the Tea Party in the United States matter all that much on this issue. If you look at the global energy economy, it is state-owned companies um, in the Middle East, in China, that are completely dominating the global energy uh, infrastructure. If you change the composition of the U.S. Congress, you vote in Joe Rome as president, pick your pick I, I your wouldn't person. vote for him. I, I might vote for him. It would be fun. Um, <laughs> you, you, you pick your, your composition and then say, well, does that change things globally? You know, I think we give ourselves too much credit in our ability to fight our interseen partisan battles. Um, let me just say, I, and just to correct one thing, I don't see energy access as a trade-off with climate change. What I am trying to present, to be very clear, is if we do the energy access thing right, then climate gets to piggyback on, back of, on the back of it. I can think of 
if I am going to go, you say, I'm going to pick human being X at random on planet Earth, you need to make an argument to them for why we need energy innovation. Given the distribution and equity around the world, um, yeah, if they're from Boulder where I live, maybe climate change is what I lead with. But in general, it's probably we're going to need a lot more energy and we don't know how to get there. Um, and oh yeah, you're going to deal with this thing that's going to affect your children and grandchildren. Yep. So I, I think that... Don't most people in the developing world support climate policy? I mean, the, the way more people... The U.S. is something like 70th in the world in terms of the number of Amer people who believe that humans cause climate change, which seems like an okay proxy for you know, public appetite. Um, for you could say that, but you know, India with uh, you know, the head of the IPCC is an Indian, um, Rajendra Pachuri, who has said very explicitly, India will be, ha I mean, he's a scientist and he's participating in the political debate. He says, India will be happy to talk about emissions reductions after 2025 when we're as rich as you. So, you know, the, 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 the uncomfortable reality of the international climate debate is that it, it has caused a deep divide between rich and poor countries. It's a lot of suspicion and a lot of uh, resentment at how climate policy has been framed by a lot of folks in poor countries. But I agree. I'm just yeah, wondering, yeah. like, I just, like the, <laughs> just to insist on the, the final point, point of my question is, like, it seems... You can have it. It's yours. Cl <laughs> climate policy people and scientists take a lot of hits in your work, but other people who it seems in, like, every, you know, in terms of actual everyday politics have probably done more to prevent progress are not in the story. And I, I can take, okay, so you can say, the, take the coast out of the picture, it's not going to solve every problem. And, and I agree. But, but I wonder if they are kind of getting off lightly in the, in the basically cast of, you know, heroes and villains. Yeah, well, okay, well, let me just answer that. I mean, if, if this was about, you know, adding up scores, I'd agree with you entirely. Um, but look at it as I'm practicing what I preach. I don't think those people matter. I think the legitimacy of the climate science community matters. And I think people who at least formally say they really care about climate policy matter. And it's much more important for me that they put forward solid policy architectures and maintain the integrity of science. And you know, to be honest, I do not care what the Heritage Institute does. I don't. They can do. They can put up billboards. They can, you know. I do not care because I think they are largely irrelevant. So, yeah. If you want me to say mean things about them, let's go to dinner, we'll have a few drinks, and I'll let loose. But in terms of the policy debate, they they are a nothing burger. I mean, it's. <laughs> that's how I feel. Okay. Right. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so please come back uh, next week um, and uh, the rest of the summer we're going to have uh, a, a number of other lectures uh, in the weeks ahead and I hope you'll come back and join us then as well. But tonight, thank you again, Roger Pilkey. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>